No, they're so oh, hot. I love that. They're like, why they're is there no Should we start a movement? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. I wonder how we started that. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We're going to get started now. Thank you for being here today. Welcome to the Paul Creative Arts Center. I'm Mel Bullock. I am the Education and Outreach Manager here at the Museum of Art. I know some of you. Nice to see you back again. Um, so welcome to tonight's program. It is an art lab, and the topic we're looking at today is exploring the work of Sue Pelt with Marla Bretschneider and Lauren Children. And we're calling it in conversation because we want it to be informal, we want it to be a conversation. Um, and this program, again, exploring the work of Sue Co is a compliment to Sue Co, Why No Justice, currently on view at the museum right next door, and it will be on view through December 2nd here. Um, and if you missed Sue's talk last week, we'll be getting it up on our YouTube page in the next week or two. So you can also um, find that and dig a little deeper there. Um, so what we'll, we'll do tonight is our panelists, who I'll introduce in just a moment into a little bit more detail, have chosen three works that are on view in Wino Justice. And we're going to have a conversation about them. And not just any conversation, but one that relates to both their areas of expertise and also to the urgency of both the subject matter, why we are still talking about these works from almost 30 years ago, and what it means to the conversation today about what we're seeing in America and globally and the violence that we've all witnessed in the last few years and the need for firsthand observation <coughs> and or a critical look at power systems and dynamics and what it means to view, but also to put that work back out into the world, into conversations like this. So, before we get started though, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So this event is anchored at the University of New Hampshire, which is located on Nadakana, the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the people who have stewarded Nadakana throughout the generations. We acknowledge that some of these peoples are currently lacking federal recognition and that this land continues to be unceded. And on that point, I just want to um, acknowledge the current state of violence in our neighboring state, in Israel, in Gaza, in Ukraine, and know that that will be part of the conversation. And for whatever it means to acknowledge it, that's what we'll do tonight as well. So with us tonight are, get out of the way here. Is I standing in front of you, no, Marla? not at all. <laughs> uh, Marla Bretsteiner, who is a professor of Political Science and Women and Gender Studies here at the University of New Hampshire. She is a short bio. And Lauren Children, who is a senior reporter and producer at NHPR's Document Team, a narrative-driven, long-form reporting project. Lauren is also the host and reporter behind The 13th Step, a podcast about sexual misconduct and the addiction treatment, treatment industry. And not so... Marla feels left out. Marla is also a scholar <laughs> and an activist Never. and is involved in work in all of those circles. Um, currently, and will tell us more about it as well. So just one thing before we get started about why they're here, why, why we ask these two experts to join us and to make this conversation tonight. So if you have seen the exhibition, Why No Justice, you know that Sue uses raw graphic images frequently based on her own first-hand observations to throw an uncom uncompromising spotlight on societal inequalities lurking in the shadows of America. And tonight, we've invited these two experts who are working at the intersection of storytelling, justice, and the examinations of the politics of power in America to explore those works and to continue that conversation of why there needs to be an urgency around them today. So, just as a teaser, these are the three works we'll discuss today. Um, 
I've gone and curated them in a, a specific order, but we can also move them around. So I thought we would start with Baby Colors from 1985. It's an uplifting start. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. And I would like to just do, sorry, one more thing I forgot. I'd like to thank Gallery St. Etienne in New York City for the use of all of Sue's works as well as the images that we're, we're looking at right now. Great. So I thought we could start by, um, why did y'all choose this image? <laughs> why, are, why are we starting with this today for this conversation? Well, um, First, I'll say that um, just as a, if you haven't heard the podcast that we put out recently, The 13th Step, uh, it was an investigation into the former CEO and founder of the biggest provider of substance use disorder treatment in New Hampshire. And it turned out that I was able to dig up multiple allegations of sexual misconduct involving this guy. You know, a person who had left the treatment center that he had paid for this woman to get treatment. He like sent dick pics to her on Snapchat the day she left. His treatment center, not great. Also, an employee of his alleged that he sexually assaulted her in the middle of the workday. A third employee was a former client who also alleged sexual assault, so some big, awful allegations. We went to print and did it as a local news story and faced some pretty significant retaliation. Um, me and the station were sued because of this reporting. My house was vandalized. My parents' house was vandalized. My news director's house was vandalized. It was a very like violent response, and there have since been uh, arrests. It's like a federal investigation. It's a big thing. There's a lot to take in, I realize, but I bring that up by nature of a lot of what I'll probably share today is related to that reporting process and that experience. And I think, of course, like some of what I loved or was so fascinated by about Sue is that I feel like some of these pieces could have been made yesterday, and this is certainly one of them. But the reason why I bring up all my background is because a lot of what I saw in this is just such violence and anger. And despite that this is like 1985, I think it's so obvious that, of course, in this summer when Roe was overturned, we you know, were in a moment in our history and still are where violence tends to feel like it's more accepted or a more common way of reacting to things. And so to me, this was just like, wow, it might be 1985, like I wasn't even, I wasn't, I was almost born, but I wasn't. <laughs> and yet, like this could be anywhere, um, which is terrifying, but also um, that's when you know it's like great art, I think, it's that it's so like evergreen in a way. Um, so that's like a long story of why and how I'm here. <laughs> so, yeah. I think for me, um, so much is actually similar, and then we have our, some of our differences. Um, I think we're, we're, we share uh, uh, our experience of a lot of the work and the works that we're um, focusing on tonight in this point that um, maybe she, she made this art in the 80s or the 90s and how stunning in both in the variety of ways that that could mean literally to stun one and stop one in one's tracks. Mm -hmm. Stunning it can be to um, come into the curated exhibit in the museum and see these today in the context of our daily life today. And that they, they might not have been the same, et cetera, but um, both the content and the feeling of them are still completely relevant in a way that we all would have liked, you know, we all would have wished we got somewhere on. And um, for me, one of the things that's key about this one, similarly, is, um, <clears throat> is are some of the issues about how do you work with various kinds of subjects relating to violence and not sort of re-traumatize people in the process. Yeah. And, um, and you know, I have a, I, we all, we both have kinds of responsibilities to the people that we work with. And for me, with my students, certainly colleagues and, and research comp, uh, context, whatever, but it's always a constant conversation if you're um, in a teaching field and sure in your own ways of yeah. how do you do that? And I could have, so, um, and also as Molly knows often about how like, I just, I am so grateful that we have the museum and these fabulous people who work at the museum because um, there are so many different ways to get at the material that I'm responsible for in a classroom that I could never get at in the ways that I've been trained. And you know, I'm not dissing myself, I'm totally pro-academic and all that, but it's such a delight 
um, even when the subject is so hard. And so I sort of feel like there's nothing I could actually say or present in a classroom, and some of my students are here. I could never present this I mean, with this intensity in a classroom right. in this way. And so that's why we need you know, of these multiple um, opportunities for learning. So those yeah, are I some agree. of why this, this really stood out, and it's great that it's our first choice. I agree, and I would also say, um, like I, I, even though I'm a journalist, I feel that audio journalism, podcast, documentary, radio, those are forms of art to me, and that there are ways that we can bring people to a story in an intimate way that you can't, not to like knock print journalism because it's very important, but that we do it in like such a different way. And so this also reminded me of a piece that came out uh, when Roe was overturned on This American Life, which I think is called The Pink House at the Center of the World or the Center of the Country or something like that. And they actually go to the clinic that is the clinic that is like mentioned in the actual lawsuit that is being dealt with. Um, and so there was a scene where this woman who is coming in for care and there are protesters outside and the protesters are screaming at this woman and the woman, there's a, a person from the clinic who's leading her in and is like yelling F-bombs back at the person, but they're also like blasting weird 80s music for some reason to try to over like shadow the protesters. But it's just this like crazy noise and drama and feelings and it's like really aggressive. And you're also like this poor woman is like about to go for this like really emotional <laughs> procedure. So it's just like this like big like torment of feelings and aggression. And this, I'm like, well, there that there's that too. Like that, it's like there's so many ways to convey the same thing. Um, you know, from all these years in between. And it's just, I don't know, I agree. Like, the, like us sitting up here, like talking about how emotional of a debate this is for people is one thing. But when you see something like that or you hear audio, um, I think it can be so much more powerful. Um, and amongst many other reasons that it's so sweet for me to get to do this with Warren is that, so I am older and I was an activist in the 80s when this, when this was our sort of daily life. And we had gotten to a new uh, sort of moment in the situations about reproductive justice and violence against women that, um, that we saw this um, development of the movement to actually fit, to do violence against, to kill doctors and providers, to bomb um, uh, medical facilities that provided this kind of care. And so, you know, me and my generation, my cohort, were the people who were then um, still the activists. I mean, everybody could be in need of this for all, all the people in your life, but also as the activists. The, I was somewhat newly political. I was a younger person, and this was some of our work. And one of the main things that people could do was we took, we, we took shifts to stand outside of different medical um, procedures. And right here in the Seacoast, I didn't wow. come to UNH into the 90s, right? But um, I was already old by then. But, um, so I, I got to UNH in the 90s, and it was all thing, a lot of our women's studies students, there was a whole thing connected on campus that we were a main source of volunteers and activists who could go and escort individual people yeah. in who could stand outside um, and try to be protective of the space. So that was my, so it's also, it's, it's very intense for me to see them also having been a part of that. Sure. I was never part of a, an actual bombing, but they were just happening, and we had a very active situation um, here at, the, at our local medical facility and the place where I lived before and where I was a professor before I came here. Wow, that's really wonderful. So yeah, so to think of, it's just so incredible to get have us both here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, anything, like violent is un, obviously like hard for me now. Um, so basically what happened with our situation is that um, I reported this local news story about these allegations and we knew we were going to make a podcast out of it and that's what the 13th step is, which I highly recommend you listen to. Um, but <laughs> so um, we knew that we had enough to, we were planning to do a podcast, but we knew, you know, those are some pretty serious allegations, like we shouldn't hold on to them for the sake of our narrative. So we uh, decided to publish a news story, and a couple months after that, um, uh, someone threw a rock through my parents' basement window and sprayed the C word in red paint on their garage. And then a house I used to live in in Hanover, New Hampshire, 
Uh, same thing, C word, spray painted on the door and a brick through the window. And my news director's house, C word on the front door, brick through the siding. And, you know, at the time, I, you know, it's pretty common, of course, for journalists to be harassed online, especially female journalists, journalists of color. It's like not uncommon to face some blowback. But I, I've actually been pretty lucky. Like, I covered politics for most of my career, and, you know, this is funny. It makes me like sound, I'm not that like old, but like for, for my beginning of my career, like it was pretty same old, same old. Like if you were in politics, you kind of bought into it. You knew what the rules were. If you didn't like a story, you'd call the editor and complain about it. You wouldn't like storm the Capitol or you wouldn't, you know, so it's like, it's like, wasn't that long ago, but like um, anger or like disrespect or disdain over a story would be taken in like a, we're all understanding the rules kind of way. And this, um, though I've done big stories before, I did a podcast about the New Hampshire primary that kind of called into question like why we hold on to that thing so like aggressively and it's because it brings us power. So people didn't like that, but like nobody came with bricks to these houses. So I knew that it had to be in response to the reporting that I had just done. Um, I didn't know who did it, but I assumed that it had to be related to this. And we've now found out through a federal investigation that in fact, um, it was one of the close friends of the guy I investigated who paid three men uh, to do that at those houses I mentioned. And then a month later, they found where I really live and wrote just the beginning in red spray paint. So the red spray paint for me was like, there it is. Like uh, just the beginning and threw a brick through a window. So underneath the broken window it said mm -hmm. that. And then they hit my parents' house again with the C word. And this like, you know, like, I mean, everyone assigns meaning to words in their own way, but for me, like the use of that C word to me felt like really misogynistic and aggressive and um, violent. And it was just like, I, I, I think a lot of what I thought was like, this isn't just about me, like this is an attack on the First Amendment and women doing journalism. And that is just like, what, what, what kind of world do we live in now where that's how we show you know, they didn't like the story. And this is how I feel about the violent acts here, which is like, how could a, such a personal, I, I understand like the passion about this procedure and what it really means for all sides of the issue. But when things resort to violence is when it's like, it just, it still blows me away, like in any, in any capacity. So I thought this was like, it's like the everything image for me, which is like, it's a lot to look at. We can change it if you want. Um, sitting up there. But yeah. Yeah, do you want to keep it or switch? Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, this gets easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, um, so this one I was reading downstairs is about people who work in, I believe it was clothing factories, mm -hmm. and um, most of them had immigrated here, so were concerned about being deported despite the really awful conditions of their workplace. And so at the bottom it says they are reluctant to speak to the investigator for fear of getting fired. So as a journalist, um, I felt like this was like, regardless of what I just worked on, like this is such a huge, powerful image for us because oftentimes, you know, we're trying to bring light to situations that are troubling or problematic, but it's not really up to us, right? It's up to people to feel brave enough to speak to us strangers and then to allow these strangers uh, to make your story, your trauma, in many cases, public. And that's a big thing, right? That's like a big thing to ask of somebody or to trust somebody with your personal story. But if not for journalism, we may never hear about situations like this or the one that I've been referring to. And what ended up happening in our case was it took me a year and a half to even get to that news story because so many sources, former employees, victims, uh, corroborators of victim stories, were just so afraid that they would be retaliated against for speaking up. Whether it was, I signed an NDA and I can't speak ill of the company, or I'm afraid of the CEO, Eric Spofford, he's wealthy, he's powerful, he could sue me for all I've got. Um, he's connected to dangerous people. And I would hear these things while reporting. And you know, you take them in, you respect where people are coming from, but I still had to pursue the story. 
Um, but so many times people would give extremely understandable explanations for why they didn't want to go on the record or they didn't want to talk to me at all. Or in some cases, I had people come in, do an interview with me in our studio on the record, say their name into the microphone. And then when my house was vandalized, called me up and was like, I'm out, which, you know, I respect. <laughs> like, so this is, I thought, such a powerful image that gets at that kind of power dynamic at play when a person in a vulnerable situation is getting harmed and wants to find accountability, but just feels like the power struggle or like the, you know, ability to put food on their own table is just, you can't knock that balance off, even if what you're experienced with is such a big harm. Um, so this one is another real Sue Co uplifter. <laughs> like, so. uh, yeah, and I, um, there's a lot, so much that resonates with what you say. And again, notice, so it's this, it's kind of a sketch and then, and then there's that red in the center. Mm. Um, it's so intense for me. Um, and I'll, in terms of my, per, so for every worker, every worker faces a situation of to what degree are they able to actually name any difficulties or wrongs? This happens, we are just talking in our class, can we name violences against us? As workers, how much, like the dynamic, it's not just these poor people somewhere else, right? All of us in the university, in the art world, all of us actually often are in situations where we then risk, you know, people are reliant on my income and my health insurance from this place. And so we're, many of us, I don't mean to make us the same, but many of us operate in circumstances where we're faced with a similar situation that we feel like we, it's very hard to find, to be able to and find ways that we can mm -hmm. speak out because a lot gets at risk and also violence. Um, even on this, this campus some years ago, we had a situation <clears throat> of targeting the Women's Studies Department. And every so often the, um, I don't know about its current location in Hamsmith, but we used to be in a different building. And every so often there'd be like a graffiti run and that was bad enough and that was hard enough. And then there was a period a few weeks, a few years ago where um, some people started, they created flyers and they flyered the campus and they took, photogra they took photographs of some of the Women's Studies faculty and they put their office um, information and their office hours. Ugh. And they they can't they flyered the campus. Oh, sorry. Right. So um, you know, it ha like things happen. But also for me, then personally, in other ways, I'm very connected. Almost everybody sitting in this room has to have had some people in their family who came over here at some point from somewhere. And I'm very connected to my immigrant roots and my roots also, particularly in the textile industry and the um, and sweatshops and all of that. And um, and then I can remember by my generation. So then my dad and my, my dad eventually becomes an owner. And I can, so we're, we're no longer the first immigrants, we're no longer the workers in the sweatshops. Mm -hmm. And um, interacting with my dad, if he's gonna own a factory, like I would go to that factory and I'd be like, you know, who was I? I was this like little person, whatever. And I'd be like, you know, following up on my dad and asking if there was a unit at the factory, like where I got all this stuff, <laughs> but I can't tell you, but you know, Wisdom and knowledge somehow transmits to intergenerationally. I'd be asking him, are they unionized? And he would say they have a workers' council. I'm like, I'm a little skeptical of a workers' council. Well, I was like a teenager, whatever. But, <laughs> um, and then the, especially, I can remember the first time, I'm sure I was super late to the game, but I can remember when I began to learn about the situation in Mexico and in South America. Um, about the, these, this context and in the textile industry. And then there's my own family. At a certain point, right, it becomes le what, NAFTA. This is like, I'm already an adult. Um, Clinton presidency, a new kind of trade agreement. And um, increasingly, my, my family's colleagues and all the, um, all the small business, they were all tiny little textile businesses, but are going bankrupt one after another. They're going out of business. And it's a direct, you know, I could study, I was becoming politicized and I was like a student. And then there, you know, I could study that. It was a, also a different kind of education to see all of these people in the neighborhood I grew up, because things, people happen in groups and their cultures and ethnicities, right? One by one, everyone's going out of business. And what does that mean? The flip side of our experience of all these people I know who suddenly their families are out of business is that there's more and more of people in these parts of the world who are being hired 
in far more exploitative ways and violent ways. Right? There's a direct correlation mm -hmm. between something's happening here and this is when I'm learning about, and then because of NAFTA, actually this situation gets worse. Right. Right. So a lot of these issues, you may not, we may not always think about how they have, of course there are primary people that we need to be looking at, and we can never keep our, take our eyes off that, and at the same time there are always so many um, interwoven and you know, at the same time inherently linked um, different kinds of dynamics throughout something that is just even happening in this one really important drawing. Yeah, it's um, not related to the work I do, but the like the person that I am, which is pretty wrapped up in the work that I do. <laughs> but um, I love clothes. I love shopping. I love. I just that's just part of who I am. And yet, as I grow up and learn more, and like despite I don't, I don't make that much money, but that I can afford more than I could when I was in high school. This like concept of fast fashion and how devastating it is to our environment and how devastating it is to be to people and generations and families is something that I feel personally like I need to grapple with more and that the dollars that we spend are such investments in not just like one item but like where, where that item come from what does it represent where's it going to go when you're done what does that do for our climate what does that do for a family like it's just this I think is such a good reminder of like the most powerful stories to me are about like individual people. And it's just a reminder that there is an individual person in most cases, I mean like AI aside, but like that are attached to like the things that we wear or the things that we eat or the things that we choose. And that also all came up for me when I was looking at this. Um, there's so. a, I'm sure many of you have done it. I haven't done it with this particular class yet, but there's an exercise um, people often do, which is, um, to at any specific moment, whatever group you're in, everybody take a look at the label yeah. of your clothes and see where your clothes um, were manufactured. And also there are different rules about how much subcontracting ends up in the actually noted. Like why does it have to say it made in China? Like why, why is that a thing? Then how far does the subcontracting go? Right. And so when you do it in a class context, then we could do other things like we could have a small research project on the company that made my shirt. The student, you know, who's sitting there in the class. And my class knows I like to sort of create these mini research projects to teach um, our own way into different dynamics that we're learning about. And, um, and we can never, there's no, again, as people find that kind of exercise really important, and a lot of us keep doing it, but there's no way, even on an exercise that's not like a straight lecture, oh, it's creative um, pedagogy, there's just no way that even that Totally. can teach us the kinds of things that this piece can teach us. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Can I add one thing about this piece? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it fits so well with what you're both saying, like thinking of NAFTA, thinking of the textile industry in America, thinking of people who like clothes, and thinking for this piece specifically, um, it ties into all of that about this individual story that each one of these people have, but also this, um, the way that these big, big players in these collective actions form those individual stories. Mm -hmm. um, because Sue caught, caught, observed these workers actually in the garment district in New York City, too. So when we think about what happens with NAFTA and global trade and who becomes an immigrant and what work they do and how things, specific, specifically for the time period, too, like you're talking about, Marla, um, if everyone is looking now all of a sudden at overseas production or in um, Central America, there's a lot of gray area for who's left to be an American worker and who we, who we pay attention to as an American worker. Um, and just thinking about, to the value that we place on who does what mm -hmm. um, for us, whether we think about them as people who belong here or wherever, you know, but just thinking about the valuation that we put on that too, when these people could live in your city, in your town, and you right. have no idea what their days right. are like. Yeah. Um, right. And I remember, like, I remember being up here at a certain point learning about um, seasonal migrant workers in New England, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, when I came up here, I used to say all these things about what I thought the racial constitution of this place was, right? Until I started to actually learn something about the constitution of who's here and who does what work, and that those people were just completely invisible to me. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I might have bought an orange at a supermarket in the summer, 
but I had no idea what was happening all around me. Maybe it was on oranges because we're in New England, whatever, but, right? <laughs> right. You know, of course, it took me, I had to actually, of course, go out of my way. I had to be shown what was happening, what went into that, the 350 that you're like, yay, I got this cool shirt for 350. Like, it, that 350 is part of a system. And as we do a lot in our class, that all these things are, um, again, they're inherently related, right? And they co-construct each other. So it's not surprising Right? So now you're hearing from Molly, that was actually, Sue was looking in New York City. But these are mostly workers from El Salvador, like I shared with my personal experience. Often their whole cultures, the way these things work, is, is um, you may get caught up as an individual, but often you're also caught up with groups of people who are constructed to be the next group. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I don't want you to miss the fact that there's also a cultural component, an ethnic component for the people um, in, the, in the particular mm -hmm. piece there. Yeah. How are we doing on time? Do we yep. go to the next one? Okay. Oh, great. Great. Oh, yeah, you could have asked questions any time. We forgot to say that. <laughs> so if you have questions, you should ask. You can ask at the end, but you're also welcome to ask now. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to end on I'm done. We only have three, right? this. <laughs> um, which is pretty self-explanatory. I was uh, reading that a lot of the reason why Sue made this particular group of artworks is because the 80s were when we got CNN and then we got MSNBC and Fox. And so this was like the buildup of, you guys are like, I know, I was there, thank you. Like, <laughs> this is like when uh, big TV as we know it today, like really kind of started. And so that of course is funded by advertising and no one here needs to have explained it to them that a big chunk of that is political advertising. Um, there's a joke that the candidate's just name just flew out of my head, unfortunately, but that MUR is the, oh shoot, I should know this, but the building that blank built, it's a candidate for office, but basically that you know, candidate ads go right to WMUR, like they gotta fund the station and so ads pay for that, right? So I picked this though for a kind of a different reason than the obvious, like that's the political campaigns and they're paying money and yeah, and we just get fed like propaganda all day, which is relevant to so much. But for me, I think that um, for media, when unfortunately uh, resources and finances are what fund the things that we hear or see, it's a really like dire time for journalism. I'm sure everyone is aware, but it's an especially difficult time for podcasting right now and audio journalism where some of the most impactful works, long form pod podcasts, there's a, there used to be a show that delved into just the Supreme Court out of WMIC. A lot of them have been cut. There's a Pulitzer Prize winning story about injustices done to Native American families that went to these Catholic schools and were abused and they won a Pulitzer for this and now they're gonna get cut next season because these are not the kinds of things that make money. And yet, they are the kinds of things that do incredible impact, right? And they, and they make people sit up straight and potentially act in response or are informed about something that they wouldn't have otherwise known because those reporters were able to take time to do these things. But unfortunately, long-form projects don't work on sales schedules <laughs> and long-form projects aren't always predictable or reliable. And so it's hard to sell ads on those things or it's hard to get people to pay for those things. And so unfortunately, financial decisions so often drive the kind of content that we have access to. And that sucks, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I picked this one. Um, but of course, I also work for New Hampshire Public Radio, which is a completely different model where we you know, don't have a paywall, um, but we do ask and the biggest support that the biggest amount of funding that we get comes from normal people, which is a wonderful system, except for not everyone can afford to pay or, so it's like the cycle of like, what is the right way to do? and What should we expect from people who receive this content? Um, I believe we should pay for it, but it's not always, you know, what's workable for everyone. But if we don't have money, then we don't get the content, blah, 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 blah. So what we end up getting is situations like this where people who will pay for that ad time are what we end up seeing. And so the, there is a power dynamic there and like who can fund it. That's why we have so many great celebrity podcasts or that's why we have so many like 
loud podcast because those people can find the financing in ways that like I might not be able to or other more newsy things might not be able to. So, And certainly the situation in the United States, the politics of um, whatever remains of our public broadcasting systems, how the history of how those came to be and how they're going out and how is it that the United States, if they're public broadcasting systems and somehow we understand that there's a, a societal need being served for information that's not always ex explicitly partisan, right? But we at our public institutions, why is it? There's a, there are reasons that they have to rely on donations, right. right? It's a public system, but the public, you know, in our public coffers aren't paying for it. So it ends up being a sort of voluntary donation situation. Right. And, and, you or know, a subscription situation exactly. or right. um, that's why I have to like come on every couple months and <laughs> right. ask people for money, which is not what I love to do. But I believe in the work that we do and I believe people should pay for it. Um, but it's also a public service and we want people to be able to access that information. So it's like kind of an interesting, um, complicated situation. For me also, this is 1986. And, um, which is also just important for me and the kind of uh, work I do in a class, because that was long before the way people might know, um, my, the way students and people might know of some of this from standing in the world in the US today is the Hobby Lobby decision, mm. right? About that um, in the United States, not all people are considered persons. There's a specific definition. That's another class I teach for you poor students. But not all people are persons. They don't have actually right, a certain kind of rights um, and standing in the law. And then not all persons are people, because actually since the 14th Amendment, we've revised the notion of who gets to count as a person who does have legal standing in the United States, who can be an entity who comes before a court of law. And not surprisingly, in the way that our political system has developed, um, corporations in the United States are also persons. And there was a very challenging case just you know, not that long ago um, uh, Hobby Lobby, a uh, Christian evangelical organization that, um, that was part of this store, maybe you, know, you might have shopped there or whatever, um, and about sort of recommitting to the notion that corporations actually are persons, and so they're protected in their donations for, um, in political races, electoral races, in a different way. And so a massive change that our, our system has always been, our political system and electoral system has always been basically founded on a money system. And people will say, this is sort of my political science hat, um, the, on the first, you know, the first reason, how, what's the first predictor of success in the US electoral um, contest uh, is supposed to be, in, is actually incumbency. And the second one is money. And actually, the point is they're both the top two reasons that people will win in the United States is because of money, because the way you got in the first time is, was because of money. And so now you're an incumbent and you have that sort of the money benefit twice over. Even though that's been happening for a long time, right? And for a lot of people in this room, 86 must feel like you know ancient history, right? We're still recently, the Hobby Lobby decision still fundamentally changed the way money is used in US electoral politics. And so again, as another example of um, seeing this and, and, and seeing that date when she did, like on all the pieces, seeing that date and how we started out with this conception, like, oh, why does it feel relevant now? Because we're still trying to understand and maneuver in a post Hobby Lobby world, right? right? And so it's, you know, it's completely current right now. Yeah, the only other thing I'll add that is like a different uh, vibe than that is that each of these three pieces, what I really love about the work that she can do is that she can convey her own anger. Like journalism is not mm -hmm. that kind of art where it's not about Lauren's anger. It's not about Lauren's opinions. It's not about Lauren's feelings, except for in the special case of the situation where suddenly I was in the story because my house was vandalized. <laughs> and so we had to like navigate that really weirdly. Um, but for the most part, what I found so compelling about art and especially Sue's is that it's so aggressive and it's almost intimidating that you feel like you're so like you're forced and you're subjected to her anger in this super powerful way that I find really inspiring and it's a thing that I cannot do this is the path that I chose that I am a conveyor of other stories and of course I have my own like you know biases I'm not aware of and that I am aware of that I have to check or just be aware of you know my own background and privileges but like so no one is like completely unbiased, but for the most part, we do, you know, 
we ethics and, and fairness are so important to me and neutrality is so important to me. And yet I'm so inspired when I see someone so effectively and evocatively use feelings of their own to bring you to a place uh, that you are so strong, like informed by it, you know, like those teeth are so angry <laughs> and like the first one are claws. so intense. Yeah, being down there is really intense. Like I was really kind of like, it was aggressive. And then to then I was saying earlier to Molly, like you're walking through the gallery and then there's this like little corner of this like war is trauma, like art exhibit. And I'm just like, God, this is like everywhere we live is trauma right now. And everywhere, everything we're experiencing, like everything in the world, it's just like in Maine, it's just, it's a really hard, hard time. And yet I don't feel completely flattened by it because we have access to such great um, ways to express ourselves or to not express ourselves, but to be among those who are expressing yourselves or to feel you can make an impact is why I do what I do or to listen to people who are making an impact or to share stories that move others to make impact. Um, so besides the fact that it feels sometimes that it's like, Jesus, what is happening? Um, I don't know, stuff like this is just really like, wow, we really live in here. Like, this is just so vibrant and alive, and I'm like glad to see it and, and feel all that she has asked us to feel. That's a great way to. Oh, cool. <laughs> Did you want to no, that was perfect. Thanks. Was no, I'm yeah. hoping that people have questions. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Or your own reads of. All yeah. Of it. Yeah. So I would love to, to hear from y'all in the audience your, your reads of these pieces, your questions. Yeah, I just I want to make sure my alarm doesn't go off in the middle. Yeah. Do you want to go first? Or? No, I don't. I can't speak to that one. I can, you know, in my own world, and I don't know what my students think. I have students in um, in an intro political theory class. Like I, uh, these days, I've been breaking the semester down into four major political theories, right? And it's clear none of the students there have taken that class. But each time when I'm in a um, when I'm like teaching a particular one, I do all this stuff to explain that I'm speaking from within that perspective, and that um, you know I'm wearing my hat of this political thinker, so conservatism, liberalism, whatever it is, and I can still get students. I'm not. It's not that I'm without bias, of course, but I can still get students who say who can say on a, a student evaluation, right? The, you know, the problem of this class is that the professor was so biased, and then like even if there are three. They all will say that my bias was a different political theory. Because they, they, we, we, we're not, somehow we're not doing a good enough job at raising ourselves and teaching ourselves about, you know, what's opinion, what's critique, what, what's teaching about someone else's views, what's my personal perspective. Like, there's just, things just are going wrong that I could still have that happen, that even in one class, because I'm there doing my best to be fair to each perspective. The students will end up like thinking that I like, you know, this one will criticize me for being conservative. This one will criticize me for being a Marxist. This one will, like, it's just like incredible. Because they'll maybe like, you know, needed to write a laundry list or something in the other one. So they saw my, you know, my attempt to get across with passion these different political uh, um, ideas and ways that societies are organized. So it's not exactly your, to your, but um, anyway, let's get to your question. Yeah, no, I, that was fascinating. <laughs> so I'll just speak for my own experience with this story. So, so as a journalist, um, you know, it's not my job to like take someone down, or like it's not my job to say this is what I believe. I want to do a story about what I believe, so you learn about what I believe. Like my job is to present the facts, to investigate wrongdoing, to tell stories that illuminate a larger truth about this experience of living in this moment right now. I do longer stories, so I get to have more time to do those things. And in this case, 
you know, I it was I had heard of allegations of sexual misconduct involving a powerful person. Um, you know, there is a series of like news judgment steps that we make when we decide whether we're going to do a story or not. And so why we decided to do that story? Well, this is a person in a position of power. New Hampshire is one of the states that was hardest hit by the opioid epidemic. Addiction is, of course, a huge problem everywhere. And we've, for decades, really struggled to get our arms around solving it and to even decide as a society, you know, now we're like pretty aware it's a medical issue, but it took us so long to get to that point. And so the idea of people in this vulnerable situation being harmed when they're trying to get help and that this facility was the largest facility in New Hampshire, these are all reasons that make it newsy. Um, so then as far as ethics are concerned, I, you know, these are major allegations. This is going to change Eric Spofford's life, um, that I would be publicizing these allegations. And I, in fairness to him, have to present him with these things and give him the opportunity to respond. But at the same token, I also, in protection of my sources, in respect to my sources, have to corroborate what they're saying. So the first allegation I heard was a woman who told me that she was sexually assaulted in the middle of the workday and she was an employee of his. And she told me this in December of 2020. And we didn't publish the story until May of 2021. I am not, it is not good for me, for them, for Eric, for any of our audience, if I just run out there with a story that's uncorroborated. If I don't work hard to make sure that I know it is as close to the truth as I can find. Um, because that's my responsibility as a journalist is to, to bring truth to bear. So then you know there are ethics to be weighed at every point and so we corroborate these allegations we corroborate other allegations three um like high-ranking officials at the company all spoke with a woman who alleged sexual assault by eric to them all of a sudden their stories are corroborating each other some people quit one was fired over presenting these allegations to eric so all these things are happening but i'm still not going to press because we want to make sure that these allegations are rock solid, and that's you know what I owe to all involved. Where things become interesting and new for me is when I'm sued by the person that I'm investigating, and when my house is vandalized, and suddenly you know what's fair and ethical it it would appear to be challenged because now I've been targeted by people who are close to the person I investigated. I'm being sued by the person I investigated. But the calculation for me, you know, while made more difficult, did not change. That I, you know, respect uh, my path to getting closer to the truth, and that means presenting these allegations to the person that they're about, and also working really hard to corroborate the allegations as I get them. Um, and so those are not just my rules, but the rules that I've been taught as a journalist through each of the places that I've worked from school. But really, as I learned in the last couple of years, like you also learn a lot about what's fair on the fly. And I think if you just have a good core and a focus on understanding the stakes of publishing such large allegations, um, that leads you closer to fairness. So it's not like we have, I mean, of course we have like a, a code of conduct and we have like ethics that NHPR like has on their website. Um, and there are basic things that we don't do, like I don't donate to candidates and I don't, you know, some journalists don't even vote. Like I, so we have rules that all of us follow, but um, we live in a world now where it's like constantly all of those things are challenged and you kind of have to be on the fly to make sure you're fair to everyone. Um, there was a situation we got in where um, Eric Spofford said he wanted to do an interview with me, um, but that it had to be in person and that he would have to, he would bring a film crew to film it. And this is after I'd been sued by him. And that was tough because of course I want to interview him and of course I want his responses to the questions. Up until that point, his lawyers had just sent us statements or said he's going to sue you if you go with this reporting. Um, and he, does, he didn't do any of this and your reporting is full of holes and we know people that will show you that. And we'd say, bring us the people. I'd love to talk to those people, please. Like, or I'd love to talk to him. And when it started becoming this tit for tat feeling, you know, this is not Lauren versus Eric, in my opinion. This is, this is a story and whatever you're going to provide us to get us further to the truth is what we need. And it just became clear in these negotiations that that was not going to get us any closer to the truth because I offered to call, I offered to allow him to audio record, and he, in the end, said that I was making it you know, more difficult and that I, did, I was afraid. And um, I don't think I'm afraid. I wouldn't have done the story if I was afraid, clearly. So, um, 
so it's it's like it's it's there's no there's no hard and fast doctrine, um, but there are understandings and rules that we try to follow and I think like work with each situation. There is like a classic journalistic ethics school example of like if you're covering a conflict and you see someone who is injured, oh, yeah. do you oh, take so the picture like, or do you like so hard right save now the person? The actually. I know, right? Exactly. Like <laughs> Gaza is a terrible. Is like, okay, this yeah. Do you pick up this child or do you? Me. It's like, right but there, now. you know, you could like talk for hours about it because it's like, well, mo all the people who will learn from that photo, you know, can you even make an impact? Have you like all? It's a, it's like, whoa! It will blow your mind to think about that for too long. But, you know, so we don't have a doctrine. <laughs> so this, is, this is what I should have just said. <laughs> but we have, you know, I have a code that I follow. And, yeah, yeah. So. Good question. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can sit through, like, to hear some others and then um, leave just because I really, if anybody else has questions. So I'm going to need to leave early because I for whatever reasons about other current events things. Um, but I can early, stay a little longer yeah. if you have so, but if journals or questions. Yeah, if anyone else has, I'd love to just hear, even if I then have to go after hearing from more of you. It's just, I mean, I'm sitting here, this is just brought up so much, I don't even know where to start <laughs> to say something. Um, thank you for both of you for writing. Proud supporter of public radio. I don't think I'm we will. An artist and cool. I haven't even been to this exhibit yet, which I will. Um, and I usually can eat it because I, I don't like people building brains in their way. And I was thinking if I were to depict something in today's world, I don't even know where to start with that, but what would it be? How would I do it? And seeing her images and what you said about her anger coming out and everything, um, you know, it's opened up a lot. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Sorry, if you don't know my situation, I just blurted it right out. You're like, what is up with that girl? Like, but um, I want to say thank you for sharing that. That it's like a very vulnerable thing to share about your own personal art. So I really appreciate that. Um, and it is it is a fascinating like moment. And yeah, um, no, NHPR was great. I mean, it would have been it would have been totally okay to say to Lauren, hey, I think we got to cut this one. Like, I think we got to be done. Um, but they didn't. And, and I didn't want to stop doing it, so that was great. Um, insurance pays for our legal bills, and um, I have a really supportive like family and great journalism community. Um, I think what was hard is that my sources were all, some of my sources were sued, and a lot of them were scared by what happened to my house. And so that was a really impossible place to be where I can't, there's when we talk about ethics, like, I can't be like, I'll pay a lawyer for you, right? That's just like a, that's like a way boundary cross. I can tell them where to find resources or I can point them in the direction that the internet might point them. At, you know, I can, but I can't. Um, and yet that feels, you know, normally that would have been like, of course I can never do that. With my old stories, like, of course I could never. But now it felt like a whole other ball game because it was like, look what all these people are going through. And I have access to our NHPR insurance account. Um, and thankfully, what ended up happening was for the three sources that were sued, attorneys like stepped up pro bono mm -hmm. and and helped them out, which was awesome. And then other attorneys turned up later. And if there's any further legal action, we want to help. Um, so I loved knowing that, but I also have to like stay out of it. Um, so yeah, it's um, I'm gonna be fine. Um, <laughs> and I like really? like to talk t about art. So like it, like wonderful things are coming out of this awful thing. So. That's good. Yeah. Bye, Marla. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. Um, do you guys have any other questions? 
Any other pieces that you wanted to, to discuss from the three that we, we talked about here? Or another thing that resonated with anyone? I, have, I just have so many questions. I'll never yeah. stop with questions. So, but I wanted to know, like, Sue Co, when she came, spoke about being motivated by these personal held passions. Mm. Yeah. So how is it that you sort of grab on to a story and and I know that there's like an intellectual discipline, like there is enough material you have to know totally. that there's enough material here for you to continue with. Right. But what is there a feeling? Do you have can you bring feeling to your work as well to say this I really feel strongly about this? Yeah. And that it's worth pursuing. Maybe you could talk about the difference between being assigned something. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, lived in Chicago. Well, I'm from New Hampshire, but I was a city hall reporter in Chicago covering politics before I came here. And in those cases, I'm just assigned. Like, uh, it was Mayor Rahm Emanuel was the mayor at the time. Where he was going, Lauren was going. And so that was, like, my life. It was, like, what did he say? What is Newsy? And, like, anything I could kick up around along the way, like, good for me. And I would try to pitch stories. But for the most part, like, I was... It was my beat. Like, I had to know what he was saying and what bills were coming up and, you know, what his response was and blah, blah, blah. Here, in this position, um, a lot of what I've always done is I feel I have a particular style. It's not, um, like, a partisan thing, in my opinion. It's like there are certain kinds of uh, tape that I think is evocative or the way people share things or, um, you know, bye. You guys can all leave if you want. Um, no, no, I uh, respect. Um, I gave them the okay behind you. So oh yeah, they no. Their I could. Over. I've been there. Bye. <laughs> like, cool. I'm so glad. Sorry, I interrupted earlier of your lecture downstairs. Um, so I, um, with this story in particular. We heard that uh, there was a COVID outbreak at one of these Granite Recovery Center's facilities. This is in like December of 2020. And we were getting tips from nurses that were like, this place is a mess, like they're not taking care of people here. And I thought, well, you know, it's 2020, is it important? Like, you know, I'll help out with this coverage. Um, and somebody told me while I was looking through that and talking to other people in the recovery scene, like, oh, like we'd be lost without Eric Spofford's facilities. But essentially, like, we all have a real hard time with him for myriad reasons. And yet, if he were gone, like, we would be in trouble. Like, we need, like, it was kind of like this, like, weird situation of, like, he, he's bringing a lot of problems around here. He's causing a lot of drama. But we need him. And to me, I was like, something's going on there. Like, there's something going on here that's bigger than just, like, Someone's not taking care of people that are getting COVID and they're coming for help. So when I, so that's when it's like that is a me thing that I'm like, hmm, that's weird. That's like quite the imbalance. Like, and then there's a layer of like, wait a minute, like it's so impossible to get someone with substance use disorder to like finally walk through the building of a treatment center, and you're telling me that like it's possible that then they might face some abuse or like boundary crossing once they're in there. I was like, that seems bad. Like that doesn't seem like there's more to it than just like. Like, I'm interested in, like, drug coverage. It's, it's more, I need to feel there's some sort of tension there, like, that can sustain a longer story. Um, but I also, like, you know, when the other reason why the, it worked as a podcast, that's like a whole other ball game, is because the people who came forward um, offered more as people than just a bad thing happened to me. And that's in part because I, I find it. I don't want people to be, like... I'm just the woman that was raped at work. Like, that's not how we want to, like, you, like, meet people in the world. Like, so I try to make sure there's space for the whole person. And when you make space for that, like, that's when they give you more as, like, a character. And so the woman, Elizabeth, who receives the dick pics from Snapchat, she talked very openly about how, you know, you're in this early recovery space where you're extremely vulnerable and then you're getting this attention from this powerful, wealthy guy who paid for your treatment, but you know it's wrong and it's like gross and you didn't ask for it, but how are you gonna say no? 
And like that's when I was like, oh, this is like way bigger than just a bad thing happening to a person. And then on top of that, another person who uh, alleged sexual harassment from Eric told me, oh, like Lauren, you know what this is, right? It's 13th stepping. And I was like, no, ma'am, I do not know what that is. Turns out it's like a very common, unfortunate phenomenon that like boundary crossing in recovery spaces is like extremely common. And despite having a lot of people in my family and friends in recovery, like I did not know that. And so that is what set us on. And what I could tell, my whole team could tell, is like this was a much bigger story than just one guy in one facility in one state. This is like a problem that we all need to grapple with. So like that's when I know we've really got something. So, yeah. Thank you. I just saw someone peek in. I think the room is reserved oh. after. No, you're good. Um, cool. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Lauren. And thanks.